Okay. Good morning. <coughs> it's early to start at quarter past eight. Um, <coughs> today we are going to talk about international logistics. And uh, but before that, uh, I think now we have fixed the exam date at least. Uh, and that may not be convenient for all of you, but uh, it is the, let's say, the, the date with the least possible uh, problems, I think, for, for the group in total and uh, the exam, the 6th of November, which is a Saturday. So that is uh, that is how it will be then now. Um, for various reasons, uh, it is a disclaimer. November or December? No, November. November. Sorry, December. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think it's early for me as well. Would have been good. <laughs> Sixth of November to just get it done. <coughs> but um, the sixth of December, yes, of course. <laughs> so um, that's that's how it will be. Uh, <coughs> today, I have for for the this this lecture I put out uh, three papers. That is uh, that uh, will be the curriculum for this uh, lecture. It's a paper by uh, Tang, which uh, deals with supply chain risk. <coughs> it's a paper by Harrison and Tom Herc that deals with international logistics. And a paper by Wood, which also deals with international lo logistics. So um, the, the paper by Harrison and Tom Herc is a bit more theoretical than the paper by Wood. Uh, so this topic will be addressed from two slightly different an angles. <coughs> um, I will talk a bit about risk and things that can go wrong, like uh, we see here. Um, so, um, and, and I, again, I think this is also a, an important part of, uh, of this course to, to be able to put the uh, more mode specific uh, things uh, into a kind of a context. So last week you had the first mode specific lecture on, on maritime shipping. Um, and this will then be uh, one of the last lectures on, let's say, the more uh, overarching uh, of one of the more overarching topics. Uh, so we'll <coughs> uh, I'll try to talk a bit about challenges um, connected to international logistics. We'll talk a bit about structure and management. And I'll try to give you an overview of what this, this rather big topic is, uh, is about. <coughs> there are different forms of internationalization that we we need to cope with, and which is uh, which is uh, which is kind of important here. Um, there are there is an increased level of internationalization, and it has been going on for uh, for at least at least a couple of decades, even longer than that. Um, we have international distribution systems, which uh, I will uh, talk a bit, a bit more about later. We have uh, international suppliers, which means that you need to deal with people with, uh, from, let's say, different business cultures. Uh, we, ha we, we get longer lead times in, in many cases. Uh, we got longer transport routes, and we also may get more <coughs> transport modes involved in the, in the in the physical movement of goods. 
We have production abroad called offshoring, which means that uh, companies are uh, are uh, setting up production facilities in other countries. We have talked a bit about uh, Eastern Asia, China, Korea, uh, but our other places in the world will also come, and I think they will be continents like Africa will be more on the map in terms of uh, of uh, production facilities in the in the years to come. So we get kind of. In, in, in some cases, at least, totally integrated globa global supply chains, which means that lots of countries are involved in, uh, in, uh, in producing uh, commodities, uh, and they may be, the players will be very tightly close together in, 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 this, uh, in, this, in these integrated supply chains. So the drivers, Behind this is a search for <coughs> low factor and supply costs. We have talked about this uh, comparative advantage uh, thing, where the costs are a very important driver. Unit costs, land, <coughs> labor, and materials. Um, we have also the need to follow customers internationally in order to supply locally and fast. Uh, also, <coughs> uh, that may also be motivated from uh, trade agreements to be good for uh, different industries to be located inside of a trade agreement area. Talked a bit about the car industry, where uh, some of the Japanese car makers have set up production facilities in Europe to take advantage of, of the EU tra trade agreements. But then again, <coughs> they demand their suppliers to be located quite close to the to the factory, to the main factory, the main production facility, and some of them even demand the suppliers to be uh, to, to be located actually inside of the factory fence or just outside of the factory fence to be able to to supply um, to give supplies uh, on a just-in-time basis, a very short short notice. <coughs> a third element is the search for new geographical market areas, uh, which is uh, which is uh, important. Uh, one example of that is uh, uh, some car makers again, which has set up production facilities in in um, Africa. To serve the uh, to serve the African market, and that is a kind of an interesting story because they then <coughs> may produce cars, models which are, let's say, not the the last generation of models, but it may be the the second to last or the third to last generation of models. By doing that, <coughs> they can also exploit the economies of scale in, in car production because it costs a lot of money to develop a new car model. And if they are able to extend the lifespan of the product, they can, uh, they can make quite a lot of, uh, of profits out of that. And if there are markets where, where Let's say the second to last or the third to last generation of of, uh, of cars is is working quite well. They can uh, they can uh, they can do it that way. Um, the same has been done in uh, in in China, where the um, 
French car maker Citroën has set up a facility, production facility, which produces, uh, let's say, slightly older models for the, for the Chinese market. But it's a kind of trying to find out what is the real needs of the end customer, and then if that goes together with extended lifespan of a product, that is, uh, that is uh, often a quite good thing, I think. Search for learning opportunities and exposure to knowledge, <coughs> which uh, talked about uh, regarding the, like for example, the, the local shipbuilding industry cluster in this country, where uh, foreign companies has entered the scene, then invested in in uh, in this uh, industry cluster to be able to to get their hands on the knowledge that is present here. One example is um, Rolls Royce, a British company. Uh, we now have uh, the Fincantier group from Italy, which has uh, uh, purchased uh, a group of shipyards in this in this region. And the reason why they do that <coughs> is is to sort of be a part of an industry network, which may provide <coughs> or add value to their to their business. So there are various mechanisms for internationalization. Um, <coughs> then we can talk a bit about structure and how uh, globalization are affecting or is affecting the structure of, uh, of production. <coughs> uh, centralized inventories and manufacturing is, uh, is one, one issue here, where you can, by means of an efficient transport system, serve um, markets from a uh, reduced number of, uh, of localizations or reduced number of production factory, uh, production plants or um, inventories, warehouses. And that may have <coughs> some advantages, which I will come back to. Time to the market, <coughs> which is uh, sort of a two-edged two sword in a way, way because it can uh, prolong the time to the market in terms of um, creating longer transport distances. But then again, one might amend that by, uh, by doing so-called postponed production, where you can source uh, modules from let's say, remote to places, and assemble them in factories closer to the market, for the, uh, closer to the end customer market. One example of that is uh, Dell Computers, which has a production factory, or an assembly factory in Ireland, not far from <coughs> the European market, but they source the modules, the components, the screens, the processors, the memory chips, and everything from uh, from uh, Taiwan, China, uh, Eastern Asia, mainly. But uh, <coughs> they can live with the longer lead times in terms of getting those those uh, supplies into their assembly plant because they don't assemble them until the, the customer already is, is in place. So you have some, some amount of inventories there to, to be prepared to assemble the order. So uh, <coughs> there is um, also a tendency towards larger units. 
that uh, I, I mentioned on one earlier lecture that the production of of items like microwave ovens are taking place in a very limited uh, number of factories actually even if you have different brands uh, that you can see in the shops <coughs> uh, the production takes place in a very limited number of, of factories so we see here there is <coughs> there is um, then sourcing of commodity items from low wage economies and where we have this have had this uh, movement or where manufacturing is moved to, to lower cost uh, countries. Concentration at specific sites, again, <coughs> based on, on comparative advantages. Uh, natural resources, I could also have added labor costs, of course, into this, uh, onto this list. Um, and also, the consolidation takes place, as, uh, as I believe, uh, how the elder mentioned last week, the the consolidation of transport flows into larger shipping units to be able to seek the cost advantages of of size of the of the shipments and uh, and hence also on the of the of the ships in 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 the case of maritime transport. So this illustration is taken from <coughs> from the book by by Harrison and Van Hoek, and it says something about the elements, important elements in in a in a framework for for international logistics. <coughs> we have the enablers, things that needs to be in place for for uh, these international operations to take place. Commoditized transportation, and you might translate that to, uh, when we talk about uh, finished goods, manufactured goods at least, um, the container. Containerization was uh, extremely important for that, for, for the uh, more <coughs> distributed production structure. Uh, and many many countries, many players involved. Container was uh, was an enabler for that. Information and communication technology <coughs> to be able to to uh, to align various operations in the supply chain. You need to have the information and communication technology in place, which has actually not been around for that long on the level that is needed here talk about breakthrough in the beginning of the 1980s. It's not that long ago we had that. The drivers <coughs> for internationalization is a factor costs, economies of scale, the, the, the advantages of, of big units. Um, we have the risks, and talk a bit about more, more about that later on today, uh, where there are uh, risks involved in, in such a distributed way of, uh, of, of doing manufacturing. Time to market, <coughs> the customers may have strong demands for short, short lead times, which may be a contradiction to the distances that we talk about here. We have inventory and handling costs, which tends to to be a, an increasingly important factor when we talk about longer supply chains. Transportation breakdowns, <coughs> and we have also this this last point, which unfortunately is uh, is uh, is a constant more or less factor: uh, geopolitical threats which is uh, on the agenda all the time, uh, I think. And the activity is to, <coughs> to try to exploit the advantages of a distributed uh, network and at the same time try to 
amend or avoid <coughs> consequences, adverse consequences of uh, of distances, has to do with risk management, the network design, to to be able to to have a a robust and, and resilient network, and then governance to have a good to have good management systems. And also to have good systems for doing trade with different, or <coughs> doing trade and have relationships with different parts in the parties in the supply chain. Because there are <coughs> challenges connected to, let's say, doing business with a supplier located on the other side of the globe. You need to have good purchasing systems, and you need to to know what you are doing when you set up contracts, when you follow up contracts to give the right incentives to the <coughs> to the um, to your supplier. If you are a uh, let's say a production facility, and you need to 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 purchase supplies, you need to have the contracts in place. On, on, uh, on adequate terms. That also has to do with very basic things like using the right uh, ways of regulating ownership and responsibility uh, along a transport chain, doing customs and documentation right and things like that, which will be given in a separate, separate lecture. So, why is risk then important? Because, as I said, when you have a larger number of, number of players involved in, let's say, producing something, <coughs> you have larger distances involved, you may have a very you should have a, uh, uh, a strong focus on risk. How risk uh, emerges, how it can be dealt with, how it can be amended. So let's <coughs> look at this statement. Even if uh, in a relatively small supply chain disruption caused by a localized event may have consequences across the global economic system. <coughs> Because the, the, um, these networks, they, they call, cause a lot of dependencies among, uh, among players. And especially in a situation where you have a focus on reducing inventory costs, consolidating shipments into larger units, if something goes wrong, consequences may be large. One example is, uh, as I mentioned on a couple of occasions, the, the credit crunch or the financial crisis in 2008-2009, which caused severe delays in, in shipments, because then the focus was on the exploiting the economies of scale, and then when the demand for the commodities just uh, slumped, it was, it was reduced very quickly, almost overnight. As the bank <coughs> Lehman Brothers in the US went broke, this spread very fast and demand slumped and then it took time to fill the ships and delays were uh, occurred immediately. And that had actually quite severe consequences for the global economic system, at least in the short run. <coughs> On a more company level, there may be more uh, disruptions connected to, to fires and factory breakdowns and things like that, which we'll come back to. So <coughs> when we do this glo globalization, offshoring, outsourcing, we may <coughs> also have to pay a price in terms of having weaker control over causes to events. 
in in the supply chain. <laughs> so uh, so uh, we may have good control of the consequences because we may fa face the consequences, but we may not be too sure about the causes. You see the difference. So <coughs> there may be a lot of what we call asymmetric information that uh, we, as a let's say, as a customer, we are made aware of the problems too late, so that we are not. We will uh, have very little time to to do the necessary amendments in terms of, let's say, getting the supplies for, from another source or uh, <coughs> change the specification of the product quickly enough to, to avoid economic losses. So the information flow may be hampered by, let's say, that the supplier is afraid of losing you as a customer. They may try to do their best to, to fix the problems in their uh, let's say in their facility or in their factory and then um, those attempts may not, they may fail and then they have to tell uh, <coughs> in the end the customer that we have problems with deliverances and hence things may, the problems may accumulate quite, quite fast in that way. And we can <coughs> have good make good use of trying to break down this supply chain risk phenomenon into into some some parts here, or to break it down into elements. We may separate between risk sources, which can be. Uh, something as simple as bad weather or uh, it can be a fire or whatever. <laughs> the risk drivers <coughs> which uh, can we can consider that as a kind of a reinforcement of, of a, a kind of a reinforcement factor once the risk source is uh, is evident. Let's say that the bad weather occurs. If you then have inadequate road maintenance, which may cause problems when uh, when uh, heavy rain or whatever occurs, the <coughs> the inadequacy of uh, of road maintenance may reinforce the consequences of bad weather. We have the impacts. If if this takes place, which is then, an example, delayed delivery of something. And then you have <coughs> two types of actions. You may have <coughs> mitigative ac actions, and you have contingent actions. The mitigative actions points backwards in the supply chain, meaning that you can prepare by having taken certain steps to avoid what you think is a kind of a in total uh, uh, substantial risk. In this case you can uh, as a company you can invest in four-wheel drive trucks for instance to, to cope with bad, bad roads a contingent action take place when the event has occurred. Then you are sort of reactive to an, to an impact. You need to do something. Once uh, the impact is there, you need to rescue a broken vehicle or something. Whereas here you, you take the steps in advance to avoid <coughs> the impact to take place. So if you, 
if you do such a breakdown in a specific case that you are that you are dealing with, <coughs> you can you can get quite a lot out of that. Identify the sources. I identify the, the drivers of, of risk and then study the impacts, what will be the consequences. And then you should do a kind of a cost-benefit analysis to find out what <coughs> type of action will be profitable for you here. Should you take some investments to so let's say to, to live with this, uh, let's say you are not able to persuade the road authorities to increase their maintenance of the roads. You may try that, but that may also be a mitigative action here. To engage into the politics and, and try to persuade somebody to, to intensify the, the road maintenance. Or you may say that, well, that is no, we don't get anywhere uh, along that, that road, so to speak, so we instead we invest in, in better vehicles. Or <coughs> you may think that, well, the impacts are not that frequent, and once they happen, we just, we just rescue, and uh, that's it. And that's how you set up these things, depends on the case in, in in question here. So these two are strategies <coughs> to the very, the very high level, uh, because I have not been going gone into s details here. But those are two different strategies: mitigations and conti contingent actions. So here you see a supply chain, a very, a very short one, where you have the focal firm, have the suppliers, have a supplier and the customer. So you recognize this from, from uh, two, two weeks ago, when I uh, showed you this, uh, this model with the focal firm in the middle, the manufacturing company, the suppliers and the customers. And here <coughs> you have environments, which are, let's say, the organization itself, and uh, and uh, let's say the company's relationships with local authorities, uh, with local stakeholders, uh, and so on. Within these boxes, <coughs> try to mention some of the risks that are involved on the various levels here. Some of them are, uh, are, uh, are, c are c common, but you see you have relationship risks, a relationship between you as the supplier and the focal firm may, may, may break down for various reasons. You have supplier performance risk, you have human resource risk, supply chain disruption risk, which is, uh, uh, you can translate that to problems along the transportation chain. You have <coughs> risks connected to the mar market, you have risks connected to any disaster, and so on. And you have the <coughs> related types of risk for each, each of these parties or partners in the in the supply chain. And now you can <coughs> one can address them in turn using this framework and try to develop strategies to address the risks. Some of these risk types may not be relevant <coughs> to the case in question. This is a generic uh, categorization of various types of risks. Well, <coughs> perhaps, um, I would say hopefully, most of them are not relevant for, for your case. 
But uh, in terms of uh, when talking about international uh, logistics, uh, the disruption risk is uh, almost always uh, an element of concern. Uh, in many cases, political country risk <coughs> is, an, is an element. I worked a bit with uh, the modern sea routes, <coughs> transportation of, uh, of goods via the northern sea route from China uh, through the to the Arctic uh, Ocean north of Russia and then down to Europe. And in that case, if you set up a service like that, the political or country risk is, is, uh, is evident. Because there has been some, some issues with, uh, <coughs> with, with the Russians and, uh, and uh, politics in that, in that respect, for instance. Uh, one might have uh, technical risks, of course. That may have been on different levels. You may have technical risk connected to whether you are actually able to develop a product according to the specifications set by a, by a customer. If you are engaged in engineering to order production, there are often product development, research and development involved, and you may not always be able to, to, to solve the technical problems, which is a kind of risk. But in such cases, uh, you, you may <coughs> want to focus quite strongly on, uh, on, uh, on the communication part of it and the dialogue with the customer and try to, to work, work oneself around that, uh, that problem. Um, but um, again, addressing the different types of risk using this framework, trying to, to design mitigative and or contingent actions may be um, a good way of, of actually addressing this important issue of supply chain risk. There is <coughs> plans for handling transport risk. I uh, did a project a couple of years ago where we um, interviewed some <coughs> transport companies that were engaged in, in international uh, logistics about their uh, strategies. What would they do if, if uh, a vehicle broke down, for instance? Because uh, the, the components that were transported in this case were quite time critical. And I said, well, we have agreements <coughs> along the way with, um, with uh, workshops that could uh, fix or uh, replace engines or whatever type of mitigative action. And they had also uh, agreements with, uh, with um, competing transport companies that they could replace uh, a broken down vehicle with, with another vehicle if, if I mean, if, <coughs> if engine replacement and things like that too, took too much time, they could simply uh, purchase the capacity from, from a competitor. But they had mutual agreements. So if the problems then occurred, f if, if the competitor got uh, comparable problems, then, then they had a mutual agreement, agreement on that. You may have <coughs> different transport routes, you can choose, uh, choo choose other transport routes, and you may even, if 
if things um, happen, you may change transport mode from rail to road, for instance, <coughs> which has been a very common, it, it not very common, but it has happened from, uh, from time to time in, in, in this country, that the rail freight system has, uh, has got, got problems and then the road transport has to be used instead. So there are also strategies for risk management, where you have uh, possibility to avoid by doing mitigations uh, to eliminate or reduce the possibility of an event. You may transfer risk. <coughs> Proactive action that shifts risk to a third party, which is what we might call uh, insurance. That's what you do when you when you purchase an, an insurance for your car or <coughs> whatever. You you actually shift risk to a third party at the price. Mitigation is closely related to avoid things, to reduce impact if an event occurs, or to do something up front to reduce impacts. Minimize risk is also related to, to mitigation. Respond to have a predetermined or planned action taken after an event occurs in order to reduce the impact. Contingent reaction. You do it, but you have a plan for how to do it after the, occur <coughs> the events occur. And to monitor, to scan, to monitor uh, the, the environment, to try to find out when something is about to happen, what, and try to to get early warnings, and to uh, to take actions if predefined thresholds are uh, are exceeded. And then the final one: to accept that there is a risk without taking any additional actions. And all these, uh, how you. How, we de how you design the strategy will depend upon the costs and the benefits of, uh, of the various strategies. Um, what happens to supply chain performance during an unforeseen event? Can illustrate like this. This is performance, this is time, and this is, uh, let's say, the current state of affairs, where we, where we have performance at a certain level. And then <coughs> uh, things uh, happen here. Uh, you may continue the supply chain performance you may have inventories of supplies and things like that, but at a point, the full impact will then occur, that you run out of a certain type of supply or whatever. And then you need to, to take actions to avoid this impact on the performance, supply chain performance, to, or to minimize the impact. The because this blue line is the, then a strong reduction in performance in this case. And then you recover. <coughs> Your supplier may, may get up and running, the transport system may, uh, may, uh, may start to work again, and you end up hopefully at the same level of performance as you were before the event took place. So the idea is to reduce both in this direction and in this direction. The, the amplitude of this blue line should be as little as possible. By 
perhaps taking some of the steps uh, as I show, showed you with, with different strategies and, uh, and things like that. Okay, I think we break for 15 minutes. <laughs>